As we continue our coverage of the death of Nelson Mandela, we begin with Randall Robinson, founder and past president of TransAfrica. He helped found the Free South Africa movement and was arrested many times during the 1980s, protesting the apartheid regime. He's now a law professor at Pennsylvania State University. He joins us from his home in St. Kitts. Uh, welcome to Democracy Now!, Randall. Thank you. Uh, your... Uh Immediate reactions to the news that you heard uh, yesterday, of, uh, that the world heard, uh, uh, that Nelson Mandela had passed? Well, deeply, deeply moved. Uh, he was an extraordinary uh, human being. Seldom do you find combined uh, in one personality uh, this kind of uh, brilliance, thoughtfulness. Uh, he was a contemplative man. He was nuanced. Uh, he was not a doctrinaire. He was charming, and he was warm. At the same time, he, he was as strong as, uh, as, as steel and, and highly principled, and um, a figure around which, uh, of course, uh, so many across the world could easily uh, rally. Uh, he, he was, of course, uh, everything to the uh, anti-apartheid uh, movement, um, and seldom uh, do you find that uh, his uh, his life uh, was a, was a very rare, um, a very rare thing? Randall Robinson, you were pivotal in this country, um, leading the anti-apartheid movement, being arrested numerous times. Talk about that struggle. I mean, we just talked about how, in fact. President Nelson Mandela was not taken off the terrorist watch list in the United States until 2008. That was 14 years after he was elected president. Each time he came into the United States, I suppose that included 1990, right after he was released from prison, he got a waiver to come in, as even his foreign minister did and other leaders of the ANC. Well, when we, when we went to the embassy on November 21st, 19... Uh, 84, to meet with Ambassador Foray. Uh, Nelson Mandela was uh, not uh, a popular figure in policy circles in the, in the United States. I remember giving a speech in San Francisco to American mine uh, uh, interest people, mining interest people. And when I suggested that he would one day be president of, of uh, South Africa, I was roundly booed um, at that just in a very hateful kind of way. And this was a general feeling in American policy circles about Nelson Mandela. We went to the to the embassy and met with Ambassador Bernard Foray and, and told him that we weren't leaving the embassy until Mandela had been released, uh, along with Walter Sisulu and Govan and Becky and all of the other political prisoners. And, of course, uh, President Reagan had, uh, of course, rolled out the copy to the white uh, government, and uh, in addition to which, uh, uh, the State Department had promised uh, uh, South African officials that the United States would remove their polecat status uh, and legitimize them in the eyes of the, uh, of the world. And so things were quite different then. Uh, but uh, we knew what kind of man Nelson Mandela was, and we knew what he was fighting against. Uh, and um, the ambassador uh, made um, a bad strategic error when he chose to have us arrested that day when uh, I went with Congressman Walter Conroy and Mary Frances Berry. Uh, and the three of us were arrested, followed by 5,000 Americans who came to the embassy over the following years. A year to be arrested, and of course that helped to propel through the Congress the um, Comprehensive Anti-Apartheid Act of 1986. So uh, it, uh, it, it, and then American investments in South Africa began to tumble, and of course that combined with uh, the internal pressures in the country produced the, the circumstances uh, uh, in the government there, the readiness to negotiate. <laughs> and to ultimately release Nelson Mandela.
Yeah, and the critical importance of that divestment movement, because now we're hearing all of the, the accolades and the uh, lionizing of, of Mandela, but really our government uh, really played a, a key role in prolonging the apartheid system and, and resisting uh, the efforts by young people uh, across the country and in colleges and universities, building a, a movement for divestment from South Africa. How critical do you think that was in, in finally convincing the apartheid government that they would have to negotiate a, a transition to democracy? It, it made every difference. Um, there was no inclination in government uh, to, uh, to, to change policy. Uh, there was in place a policy that uh, the Republican government called constructive engagement. Uh, meaning that, uh, in effect, that we were on South Africa's side uh, and that sanctions would be the wrong thing, even though the ANC was asking us to do all that we could to put in, put in place sanctions uh, because uh, they knew uh, and we knew that unless the government of South Africa felt um, the steel of some penalty for what they were doing, nothing would ever change. But once uh, the, the, uh, the loans began to disappear uh, and the corporate investors began to disappear and uh, the, the, the income uh, and the size of uh, the South African economy began to shrink uh, because of these efforts and because of these civil disobedience efforts uh, across the United States, it made all the difference in the in, in the world, and so then we saw passed uh, in 1986 in October uh, the Comprehensive Act with a Republican Senate overriding the veto of Ronald Reagan. It was the only time in the 20th century that an American president has suffered uh, a, an override um, for a foreign policy uh, measure. Um, uh, an override of a veto. So it was historic, and it, it happened because of the leadership in the Congress working with um, um, uh, us, uh, the, the leadership of um, uh, Senator Ted Kennedy, the, the leadership of Bill Gray in the House, uh, the Congressional Black Caucus, and many others, um, uh, Richard Lugar, Republican leader, Lowell Weinker, a Republican from Connecticut, became the first uh, uh, American member of the United States Senate to be arrested in an act of civil disobedience. Senator Weicker called me and said, uh, I didn't know him at the time. He called me and said, I want to be arrested. And he came and did that. And so the, the movement was broad and deep and national, uh, and it made uh, a significant difference. Uh, and it turned our country around and for once put us on the right side of an issue. Uh, we're talking to Randall Robinson. He's in St. Kitts in the Caribbean. Sorry for the poor phone line. But, Randall, we wanted to get you to respond to President Mandela speaking at Riverside Church. This was September 1998, a year before President Mandela retired from office. He visited the United States. Actually, this was the Cathedral of St. John the Divine in New York, paying tribute to Americans who supported the anti-apartheid movement. Ladies and gentlemen. It was important that during what is probably our last official visit to your mm -hmm. country, before retiring from office next year, we should spend time with those Americans who have been so closely linked with the struggle for freedom in South Africa. Our victory in defeating apartheid was your victory too. To you and to all of the American people who supported the anti-apartheid struggle, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for your solidarity. Uh, Randall Robinson, I wanted to ask you, especially the, the, he was speaking there just before retiring from office, and there's been a lot of talk uh, in the media about uh, about uh, his legacy in terms of first willing to forgive his oppressors. But I've always been most impressed 
by his willingness to step down. <laughs> so many revolutionary leaders come to power and then decide that they are indispensable uh, to their societies, and they stay in office term after term. But Mandela's willingness to step down after one term it really sent a powerful message in terms of democratic transformation. I'm wondering your thoughts about that. Well, he was one of the most secure uh, men that uh, I ever had the privilege to uh, to know, and I think he was very much outcome oriented, and he thought through everything that with that kind of uh, um, quantitative analysis. What would the outcome be, and what do we do to try to accomplish that uh, that outcome? And at the same time. He was an incredibly thoughtful man. Uh, I was in a meeting with him uh, at 7 o'clock in the morning at, um, uh, in, in, in uh, Johannesburg. I had taken a, a delegation of black American leaders there before, just before he became president. We were sitting in, in this uh, function room on the first floor of the, of the hotel. And just the two of us at 7 o'clock in the morning to plan the day. And um, a hotel maid walked into the room. Uh, and he stood up. Um, uh, <laughs> and, and she was stunned. And she said, oh, Medita, I didn't know you were in there and in here. And, and he, he was very cordial. Um, uh, to her, and he smiled, and he had this gift of making people comfortable. Uh, so he, he he would sacrifice uh, what some would think were their own uh, sort of needs of uh, of personality. Uh, he didn't have those kinds of needs, as far as I could see. Um, he was a whole person, a strong and balanced and as principled as you will ever find uh, a human being. Randall Robinson, we want to thank you for being with us, founder and past president of TransAfrica. He helped found the Free South Africa movement, arrested numerous times during the 1980s, protesting the apartheid regime. Now a law professor at Pennsylvania State University, speaking to us from the Caribbean, from his home in St. Kitts.